Come on, come to that, Metal Reddit. I didn't even give anyone, give up anyone alive. Still, said the bouncer and ruffian for hire. It wasn't the kind of thing you generally do. Most thief takers aren't as pretty as that one, and it should serve to keep her wandering around here below. Flint scratched at his thick, flea-bitten neck and said, You think that so long as she's nearby, she might decide to warm your bed after all? Alas, no, the ranger. The ranger's guild shouldn't admit women. You let a wench worship a goddess who takes the form of a unicorn and she's bound to place an exaggerated value on her chastity. Then you want to make a play for the saddlebag yourself. No, those days are behind us. Though, if it, it no, if it simply fell into my lap, what I think is that as pretty Marie blunders about some someone will decide to make some coin from her and likely sooner rather than later put the word out to the slavers that if anybody catches her I might be interested in buying or at least renting for a day or two as befitted his status as chieftain of the Red Axes, Kes Turnskull lived with a certain style in an, in an expansive, albeit decaying, house on the river. In better times, the place had likely belonged to a, pers a prosperous merchant who had built both street entrance and water gate to facilitate the passage of good in and out. More recently, diggers had connected the cellar to the underways. Thus, Aaron thought surveying the structure from the arch of gargoy gargoyles, centermost of the three bridges, he had his choice in a ways in. The problem was making sure of a way out, because it was one thing to resolve to gouge a higher payment out of Kesk and his pack of ruffians, and something else actually to accomplish it. He had to manage the discussion in a manner that would preclude the Tanarooks. Simply taking him prisoner and torturing him until he divulged the current location of the strong box. He pondered the problem for a time while the ref while the reflections of Saloon and her tears sparked in the black water rippling below the bridge. And the stone imps squatting atop the piles seemed to brood along with him. At length, when he decided on his approach, he trotted back towards shore. Knew though, knew though they were the planks bouncing and shifting under his feet. The folk of Weeble replaced them every year but not with the extraordinary care or crafts manship. Why should they, when the sculptor was de destined to devour them in any case? Keeping eye on the sprawling mansion ahead, field stone on the ground level and timber above, Aaron skulked along the docks where, in one of his occasional flirtations with honest toil, he'd loaded and unloaded galleys in flatboats. Nobody called out to him. He would have been ch ch chagrined if anyone had. Unlike some thieves of his acquaintances, he had no use for flowing cloaks and mis misliked 
cows of midnight black. Those posturing fools who did might as well have worn placards proclaiming themselves nefarious outlaws. But his un unconspicuous clothes of dark gray and brown permit permitted him to blend into the dark with equal facility. He stepped out into a deserted pier, considered removing his tunic and boots, and decided against it. Even if he could be safe of returning to that very spot, somebody was likely to walk away with him before he did. Weevil being what it was, he sat down on the edge of the dock and then lowered himself into the water. Weeble fishermen like to swap stories of pike and freshwater eels huge enough to goggle, gobble a man with a single snap of their jaws. But the creatures, if in fact they existed, were evidently either sated just then or hunting elsewhere. He wasn't an exceptionally good swimmer, but the water was still reasonably warm, the current gentle, and he had little difficulty stroking and kicking his way to the sprawling house's river gate. The gate resembled the mouth of a half-flooded tunnel protected by a particular, a port, port, porticulus. A particulus, which unfortunately was down. Aaron dived beneath the surface. There, the white light of the moon in the tail of sparkling motes that people called her tears felled him, and he had to grope his way along the still grill, seeking a breach. He didn't find one. When he could Stay submerged no longer, he came up and sucked in a breath. He knew he couldn't keep diving and searching for long, or one of the sentries would spot him. As best he could judge, the left that as best as he could judge, the left him only one recourse. That left him only one recourse. The particulars would keep out uh, would keep out any boat the spacing of certain of the spacing of certain of the bars however might permit a swimmer to wriggle through if he was thin and had studied the art of squeezing through tight places Aaron had it was a valuable knack to possess if you dabbled in horse breaking. He slipped beneath the surface, located one of the large holes in the grill work, and started to squirm through head first. Shadows of mask, it was close, closer than it had seemed when he was simply gauging its width with his hands close enough to scrape patches of his skin raw, so close that, that down there in the wet and the black it seemed to clench around his chest like a clutching fist. Aaron had gotten stuck before in windows and chimneys, but never underwater, where if he didn't free himself within a minute or so, he drowned. He felt a surge of panic and struggled to quash it. Without a clear head, he had no hope whatsoever of liberating himself. He gripped the bar to either side of him and tried to haul himself clear. No good. He drew one of his knives and sawed at his shirt in overturning, turning to strip away the layers of cloth between his flesh and the metal that held him fast. He managed to yank some tatters out, but was still trapped. 
He wondered suddenly, with a fresh shock of terror, if the porticulus was magical. The trader who'd originally built the mansion had obviously been wealthy enough to commission an enchanted defense. So was Kesk as far as that was concerned. Maybe the cursed, the cursed thing really was squeezing Aaron like a crayfish pen, crayfish's pincers. No, it wasn't. That was just the fear talking, and he wouldn't listen. He strained to drag himself backwards rather than forwards, only to find retreat as impossible as advancing. Meanwhile, his chest began to ache with the urge to take a fresh breath soon as air would run out. His air, if he, if he emptied his lungs, his chest would be narrower, wouldn't it? Maybe narrow enough to allow him to writhe his way free. Even though he knew it was his only chance it took an effort of will to exhale. He forced himself and the air was gone beyond recall. He made what would surely be his final effort to pull himself forward. At, at first, nothing happened. Then his chest popped clear, like a cork from a bottle of that sweet, white, sparkling Selmarian wine. Poor Caridi uh, had so enjoyed. He surged forward, only to jerk to a halt an instant later. He took himself. He took himself. The grill work hadn't really clamped shut around his ankles. His knees had simply caught on a crossbar, resisting panic. The impulse to flail widely, crazily, he tried to untangle himself from the obstruction and succeeded. He struggled upward. Desperate for air, as he was, it was only at the last second that he remembered he couldn't surface amid a great splashing and floundering, or else one of the red axes would notice him. He took care to complete his ascent circumspectively, or circumspectly, then breaststroked his way into the shadow, shielding space between two moored boats. Clutching at the side of the vessel for support, he sucked in air. He took all the strength he had left simply to make himself inhale and exhale quietly and he knew that if anyone spotted him before he caught his breath, he'd be helpless and def to defend himself. Luckily, no one did, and when he recovered, he took a stealthy look around. The river gate terminated in a stone platform at the end, where an arched door led fur farther into the mansion. A walkway ran along either wall. Half a dozen boats floated in the water, tied up until someone should want them. Four were commonplace vessels for transporting passengers and cargo. The fifth, a sleek galley equipped with a small ballista in the bow as well as other features useful to river pirates. And the sixth, a gilded and ornately carved pleasure barge, aboard which Cask sometimes chose to pursue his less unsa <coughs> his less unsavory, unsavory amusements. His less unsavory amusements. Two guards slouched on camp stools near the doorway, playing a game of cards for low stakes. The muscular bugbear with his hairy yellow hide was smirking, exposing stained crooked fangs, and had, and had most 
of the copper pennies heaped in front of it. The human wore a peved, a peved expression, or a peeved expression that seemed at home on his pinched and sour face. Neither one looked particularly alert. Evidently, they trusted the particulars to keep intruders out. Even so, it was going to be tricky. Aaron drew himself up onto the walkway behind the bugbear's back. He readied the sturdy oaken cudgel he had brought with him, then stalked forward. He fancied that few people could have approached the sentries unheard, not clad in soaked garments, that wanted to slap the squelch with every step. Fortunately, there was an art of moving silently under even the most adverse conditions, and he'd mastered that one too. Yet soft footfall, yet soft footfalls could only protect a fellow up to a point. He was still a few paces away from the gamblers when the human threw down his creased, greasy hand of cards in disgust, lifted his head, and looked straight at him. The red axe's eyes opened wide. Aaron charged the bugbear, twisted around, and he clubbed at the hawking creature's square brutish head. The blow cracked home, and the goblinoid jerked at the impact. By the time the human guard was on his feet and had his dagger out, Aaron dodged a thrust, grabbed hold of the little folding camp table that held the game, and flipped it upwards. Cards and coins flew everywhere. The coppers clinked on the platform. The tabletop bashed the red axe in his face, slamming him backwards. Aaron whirled back around towards the bugbear, its low forehead bleeding, and burly, no, the burly creature, taller than almost any human, its attacker, no, almost any human its attacker had ever seen lurched to its feet, snatched its scimitar from its scabbard, and raised it high. Its sleeve slipped down its hairy forearm, revealing the ruby axe brand Aaron had once declined to wear. Sidestepping out from under the threat of the curved sword, he lashed the bugbear across the ribs and kicked it in the knee. It stumbled, and that brought its head low enough for him to b bash it a second time, and a third. The goblinoid collapsed unconscious. Aaron pounced atop the bugbear and poised and Arthan fang in its throat. The human red axe who was lunging forward hesitated. Stay back, Aaron painted, or I'll kill it. The guard spat. I never liked him anyway. I think he cheats. If you're such a dunce that a bugbear can trick you, Aaron shot back. You deserve to lose your own, your coin. Now you may not like the brute, but I'll bet your chief finds it useful. Useful enough that he wouldn't appreciate you throwing away his life when it came to avoided it when it can be avoided. Maybe what do you want? Aaron nodded towards the windlass and said first raised the por porculus, the porculus. He had no intention of squirming through the bars again when it was time to leave. 
guard grumbled. That's a two-man job. The damn thing has a counterweight, Aaron said. Just put your back into it. Grunting with effort of, or grunting with effort or the porculent pretense of it, the red axe managed to do as instructed. The chain clanked as it wound around the rill. Now what the guard asked. Now you go into the house and tell Kesk to come out alone for a private talk. Tell him that if he doesn't show himself in the next five minutes, the card shark, or the card shark here dies, and he can forget about ever taking possession of the saddlebag. The sentry stood and stared at him. What are you wanting, wa wanting for, go, or what are you waiting for? Go. The red axe disappeared through the door, slamming it behind him, and after that, Aaron had nothing to do but listen for approaching footsteps, at least until the bugbear stirred. He pressed the keen edge of his knife against the captain's throat, drawing the goblin's attention to it. Don't move, he said, or you're dead. Don't matter, the bugbear said. Its bestial voice slurred. Evidently, it was still dazed from the beating it had taken. You don't care if I kill you? Don't matter. You, you, you didn't do what you was told. You're still going to die. Still? What did that mean precisely, Aaron would have asked, but at that moment, Cash Turnskull stalked through the door. If ever a creature was born to rule a company of cutthroats, Cash was surely the bully in question. Short and stooped as he was, his muscular body looked nearly as thick as it was tall. Patches of coarse hair hair bristled from his leathery gray hide and with, with it it and with its trunicated snout the jutting tusks no and jutting tusks his face resembled that of a wild boar despite the oil lamp burning beside the door the interior of the water gate was dark enough to reveal the faint luminescence of his scarlet eyes, which smoldered like coals beneath a low, rigid brow. Aaron had heard that Tenerix hadn't always existed, that the race had emerged only in recent times as the result of crossbreeding between orcs and demons. He himself had no first-hand knowledge of such esoterica, but thought that anyone who laid eyes on Kesk would have no difficulty uh, crediting the story. As always, the founder and master of Weevil, Weevil's most vicious gang, carried a heavy, double-bitted battle axe in his hand. Supposedly, he plundered the enchanted weapon from a body of a fallen foe, a gold dwarf champion who believed the axe, a cherished family heirloom, would only serve a pure-hearted warrior of his own race. Kesh liked to tell the story of how he'd provided the full wrong by using it to slaughter the dwarves' own kin. The Tanarup regarded Aaron and the bugbear. It was the Tanarup regarded Aaron and the bugbear. It was difficult to read the expression on that sw swinish face 
with its protruding lower jaw, but he seemed to be sneering. What's the point of this? Cash growled. Why didn't you come to the house through the underways as I told you to? If I had, would I be dead already? Did you have some of your murderers laying in wait for me? Kesha's red eyes narrowed and he asked, What are you talking about? According to the bugbear, you meant to kill me. You can't club Farag over the head and expect him to talk sense. He doesn't do much of that at the best of times. Now, if he's smart, he'll shut his hole and let the two of us, p p two of us, palaver, pal palaver. You expect me to forget what he said? Just use your own head, will you? Kesh replied. Why would I hire a man to do a job, then kill him, to get out of pain? I buy stolen and smuggled goods all the time, and a gang chief has to deal fairly. If I picked up a reputation of cheating, no one would do business with me. When Cash put it in that way, it did seem to make sense. Yet, Aaron found he wasn't ready to let the topic go. You'd betray a hireling in a in the blink of an eye if it was worth your while, particularly if you thought you could make him disappear with no one the wiser. We agreed on a nice fee for your work, but hardly large enough to beggar me to make me go to the trouble to play your false. I don't see the saddlebag. Where is it? Somewhere safe. It's like that, is it? I lost three friends stealing that box. Which means you don't have a, to split up the coin, said Tanneruk. Said the Tanneruk. You can keep it all and wind and wind. Wind up, wind up four times richer than you expected. Be satisfied with that. Don't think you can grind me for more. You knew to send us after the box, so maybe you knew how well protected it was. But you didn't warn me. Kesk snorted a wet, ugly sound like a pig oinking and said, I thought you knew the game, Redbeard. I thought you were a man. When a job gets bloody, a man doesn't weep and whine about it. Right, a man hits back when someone sets him up for a fall. The Tannerock glared and said, Why wouldn't I tell you everything I knew about the, the box? I wanted you to get away with it, didn't I? Maybe you feared that if I knew what I was getting into, I wouldn't take the job. Or maybe you hoped some of my crew would get killed. That would save you, Red Axes, the trouble of slaughtering us all yourselves. I told you, we weren't planning to kill you. Maybe we still won't, provided you come to your senses. The world, the war leader knows you've got a death coming for this harebrained stunt here tonight. But I've got other meat to chew. Now, where's the lockbox? What's it worth to you, really? Kesh quivered, quite possibly with the urge to charge and attack. Curse you, human, the gang leader said. We had a deal, and no one goes back on a bargain with me. I'm not re reneging exactly, said Aaron. It's just that I change, that I charge extra for every lie and lost partner. 
you don't know what you're getting into. If you've got any brains at all, you understand I can let folk cross me and live to brag about it or else I'm finished. No. If you've got any brains at all, you understand I can't let folks folk cross me and live to brag about it or else I'm finished in this town. But even that isn't the whole of it. You're starting to bore me, Cash. Perhaps someone else will pay a fair price for the offer, or for the coffer. The Tannerux shuddered, and the corner of his mouth twitched and drooled around the jutting tusk and fangs. All right, Cash said. I'll give you five times as much as we agreed on. Ten, and we'll make the trade at a place and time of my. The flame in uh, the oil lamp flared, momentarily illuminating the shadowy gate as brightly as the noonday sun. Aaron had the misfortune to be looking at the general direction of the blaze and it dazzled him. He didn't know how Cash had accomplished the trick. Maybe it was some innate capacity derived from his demonic heritage, but he didn't even need to hear the pounding footsteps to comprehend why the Tannerup had manipulated the flame. Cash had had his no, Cash had had his back to the lamp, so he hadn't been blinded, and he was charging in to attack his startled, crippled foe. Aaron flung himself to the side. Something whizzed past his head, just missing. Judging from the breeze, he assumed it was Kesk's battle axe. The rag roared something in the uncouthing language of his kind, reminding Aaron that he had two foes, not just one. Damn it. He, sh he should have taken a split second to knife the bugbear before rolling clear, but had been too rattled to think of it. He couldn't battle both of them, not when all he could see was spots and blobs swimming before his eyes. Truth to tell, he wouldn't have bet on his ability to outfight Cash under any conditions. He had to get out of there. Aaron sensed something lunging at him. He jumped backwards with a sick cert with a sick certain certainty that it wasn't enough to save him, then heard two bodies smack together and Cash bellowed in frustrated rage. Evidently, he and the bugbear had rushed Aaron at the same time and on the fairly narrow platform had gotten in each other's way. Aaron knew it had only bought him a second time he needed no only bought him a second time he needed to to use to leap back down into the water where his foes axes and scimitars couldn't reach him but which w way was it blind as he was disoriented from dodging he was no longer sure all he could do was take his best guess. He ran one stride a second and pitched into empty space. He felt a split second of elation. Then he crashed down on a solid surface. For an instant, stunned, Aaron couldn't grasp what had gone wrong, let alone what to do next. Finally, it came to him that he had landed inside one of the boats. The craft bounced as someone else jumped in with him. Aaron scrambled backwards, 
bumped into the gunwale and swung himself over the side. He maneuvered. No, his maneuver tipped the craft and Ketch cursed as he struggled to keep ba his balance. Aaron plunged into the water, then struck out in what he prayed was the direction of the river. A missile of some sort, a thrown dagger perhaps, splashed down beside him. Finally, his vision began to clear and he saw he was headed the right way. As he reached the mouth of the gate, he glanced back, backward and felt a jolt of terror. Kesh held his battle axe poised for a swing at the chain that held the particulus in the raised position. The weapon's edge glowed scarlet as he activated some magic bound to the steel. Aaron hurled himself forward. Metal crashed, no, metal clashed chain clattered and the grill dropped just behind him. Kicking up a little wave that carried him to a no carried him a few feet further out into the uh, scalp, sculptor. The trick then was to make it safely ashore. Aaron thought Kesh would send the red axes to prowl along the riverside, but if he kept on swimming as fast as he could. He reckoned he'd be able to make it onto dry land before the Tanneruk could organize the search.